Brady gets rid of it quickly. Edelman makes the move. Lunging. Touchdown, New England. Kevin, I would say, as you see Julian Edelman reach the ball across the goal line, other than the Deion Lewis drop, just a flawless execution on that drive by the Patriots. It's something you see time and time again. See the elbow down, but it's where that ball is when the elbow goes down. It looks like it's across that goal line. Hello, friends, and welcome to another edition of the Flying Elvis Faithful. It's your boy, Shaq Krosky, flying the flag of the Flying Elvis in the evil city of Gotham. That's New York City. And joining me, as always, is my buddy from all Oklahoma. It's Josh Madsen. Josh, how are you doing this, this evening? Good, because Oklahoma State won, so I'm happy. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's the, that, was one, well, that was what was definitely on my mind. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. That, you thought that was the answer that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. So happy to have you here. And we're happy to have somebody else here today. You know him from, the, of course, you know him from the NGFC Weekly. You can hear it every Wednesday or, or Tuesday, I think. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get some better idea about it. But John said is here as well. John, welcome to the Flying Lovers Faithful. Gentlemen, nice to have, nice to have you. Nice to be with you. Good to have you as well. And uh, for those of you who don't know, John, I believe you're from Massachusetts. I am, correct. I'm up here in Patriot Land uh, where uh, I'm surprised you guys are not from Patriot Land, or at least not in the area, but uh, nevertheless, uh, at least one out of three is a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, tried, I've, tried, I've tried to get some uh, mass hole experience for the show. as We had um, a <laughs> Boston chick on a couple of weeks ago, wow. so, you know, yeah, so we're trying to represent with, we're trying to represent from outside of the Boston area, so. <laughs> and how's it going so far? I am curious what Patriot Nation is like outside of New England. Well, you know, it, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's actually a pretty big following, and it's very interesting, you know, especially me living in New York City, where it's obviously enemy territory. We'll talk about that, obviously, with the New York Gi- Giants, We're, as we, as the Patriots say the New York Giants. But, um, yeah, being in New York City is kind of interesting, especially when I wear my Patriot uh, beanies, especially since it's so cold down here today. It was 40 degrees, and I was wearing my Patriot beanie. And you get the stares, you get the looks, and you get the growls, but that's okay. I, I represent regardless. Well, as long as you're not getting things thrown at you, I suppose you're in good shape. <laughs> I'm sure that's next. Josh, well, how, how, how is it representing the Patriots in Oklahoma? Um, well, th- there's a following, uh, especially in the Tulsa area. But um, the, I live by Air Force Base, so there's a lot of different uh, football fans. So it's a little bit different here because it's expected to see a lot of different teams being represented and there's a lot of new englanders living in the area because they're stationed at tinker here so yeah i mean there's definitely a group of patriots fans around the area yeah so well, at least, at least think... in josh's case uh, he's he's in a college area so that probably helps out his situation uh, in terms of uh, more people being interested in the college game maybe than necessarily the pro game Oh, definitely college here. Uh, OU and Oklahoma State. Tulsa even is pretty popular. There's a Texas following here, Longhorns following as well. So definitely represented college-wise. Yeah, so it, 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 it's very interesting just to know. And I've talked with I've talked with a lot of Patriots fans from not even outside from outside of this country. I've talked with. Patriots fans from New Zealand and Australia, so <laughs> it's wide ranging when you talk about Patriots Nation. But 
speaking of the Patriots and Patriots Nation, there's a lot to talk about. Obviously, the biggest news of the week, obviously, and it's the saddest news of the week, Deion Lewis being out for the entire season with a torn ACL, and we'll get to more of that when we talk about the Washington Redskins game. But right off the bat, Josh, talk about the loss of Deion Lewis and how you think the Patriots might be able to fend it, fend it off, if at all. Well, I mean, I mentioned this last week that I thought Deion Lewis was probably the most important player on the Patriots last week because he creates a lot of mismatches and and all kinds of different formations, and he and he makes it difficult because he he's just as good a receiver. Well, he did drop one <laughs> and against the Redskins, but he was just as good a receiver as a runner, in my opinion. So, but how is New England going to replace him? I don't think they can replace him necessarily. They are going to use Bolden and Deion Lewis, I mean, and uh, White. And I'm not sure who's actually going to be the main guy yet. I mean, I think that's going to be the surprise of this week's game. Is is James White the guy or Brandon Bolden? And I don't know. I mean, I think James White got a chance already. Um, and he, you know, just average. But one of those two is going to be really involved in the offense this week. Yeah, and I'm going to be very interested to see how that all comes about. John, I'm curious, what do you think about, especially when you, I know you pay attention to football in a general sense, what do you think about Deion Lewis and how he just popped out of the, out of the norm for everybody and just made, it, made such an impact on the, on the first half of the season? Well, let's face it. It's what the Patriots do. They give guys second chances. And in Deion Lewis's case, that's exactly what they gave him. And he was able to uh, to fit himself into an offensive system that really did allow his skills to become uh, uh, very good, not only running the football, but more importantly, catching passes out of the backfield. And when you go back to last year and you think about what Shane Vereen was able to do for the Patriots, that's exactly what they were looking for out of Deion Lewis, and they got it. It's unfortunate that he injured himself last week in really a, a non-contact situation. But uh, Lewis was giving the Patriots the same thing that Shane Vereen did last year, and now next man up is, is really going to be the, uh, the mantle of this team as it always is. And so I think James White and, and, and Bolden are going to equally get the opportunity uh, combined to be able to replace what uh, Deion Lewis uh, did for this team offensively. Yeah, and not only with the running backs, I think. I think the wide receivers and the tight ends, as I, and I emphasize Scott Chandler in, when I say tight ends because there are a lot of guys that haven't necessarily gotten all the looks, especially in the first eight games of the season. And I think with this loss, I think it'll just emphasize the fact that there are more guys and more balls to be had. And I think, I think it'll be a good test to see with this Giants team. We'll talk about that in a few moments. But right now, let's go back and talk about the Washington Redskins game. And, Josh, first of all, I know that I just want to point out something that I just noticed from watching the game. And, you know, usually I put something like this, you know, sometimes at the last part of the show or something like that. I just have to mention it now because I just think it's so indicative of what this team is. It's – I think this – team gets it and there's something about there's something about look watching this team and seeing the guys just after a touchdown especially after the um Brandon Bolden caught his first touchdown after that like it's like the whole team just rushed and just said hey congratulations and you don't see that often and I just think that there's something about this team that I don't think I've seen in a Patriots team in a while maybe 2014 last year but it's just I don't know what I don't know what it is. What do you think that that motivation might be for that team to be where it is now, Josh? Well, the, I I saw the same thing you're talking about, and it's definitely um, it is different than years past. Um, I think we saw a lot of individual celebrations, and but this year um, I think there's a lot of motivation, and a lot of it, it has to do with um, Deflategate and how Tom Brady was treated and and whether you agree with what happened or not, I mean, I'm sure there's some that 
that listen to our show that still think he probably was guilty or whatever. But I like it. I'm, and, and, you know, the other thing that I've, I've been paying attention to is LeGarrette Blunt's reaction to Deion Lewis taking away a lot of his um, carries because uh, LeGarrette Blunt has been known not to be a happy guy when he's not involved in the game. And there has been games where he wasn't really used at all. So, but he seems he seems to be okay with everything that's happening, and, and that's good to see because when he when he's running his hardest, he is he's a truck. He's hard to take down. So, I think there's a lot of motivation on the Patriots due to what, like I said, the the flake and you know Tom Brady in general. So, yeah, that's my opinion. John, do you think that the flake has Put, put a, for lack of a better term, uh, feet to the fire of all the Patriots team? And do you think that it's, it's actually motivated them to do even better on the field this year? Oh, I think this is an angry football team, and they've been an angry football team for quite some time, and I think they're going to remain an angry football team until this, uh, this season comes to an end. They're going to... Uh, uh, provide the NFL with a lesson and the lesson is that you just don't uh, mess with us and uh, so far that has been the way that they've approached every game and I don't think it's going to change and I think that that's why this team uh, is undefeated at the moment despite the rash of injuries that they have received especially in that offensive line. Uh, This team is just uh, way too motivated and uh, you know given the talent level that existed once this season began you add anger and talent together, and it becomes quite a combination. Yeah, and and a lot of and a lot of people have been making the co- uh, comparison from 2007, and I've I've continuously shot it down to anybody who listened to me because I think 2007, yes, it had its they had their motivation, but I think this year there is extra motivation, not just for the Flake Eight, but Tom Brady has been hearing a lot of. You know, he's old, he's too old, he can't do anything, but, you know, he's just been crushing everybody. And the fact of the matter is, I think that, I don't think the Patriots have reached their peak yet. And I don't think I I would be, you know, crazy to say that because they really haven't. And especially with the injuries in the offensive line and all the cornerback issues that they've had, I think that there's still room for improvement, which is crazy to say with an 8 no team. So... That's, that's well, look, let's face that. it, Brady, you know, Brady's already averaging 338.6 yards a game throwing the football. He's already thrown 22 touchdown passes. So I think he's demonstrated that uh, the age thing is not necessarily a factor yet. He's getting rid of the football quick because he realizes he's got an offensive line that may not be able to hold their blocks as long as maybe they should. So he's helping out that offensive line by getting rid of it quickly. He's got wide receivers that also understand that situation. This intermediate, this really medium-range passing game that they have uh, established this year has just been lethal, to say the least. They don't necessarily have the outside team speed to be able to stretch secondaries, but they really don't need it. You've got a tight end that is just a problem for anybody and everybody to have to deal with in Gronkowski, and you add what they get out of the uh, the running back uh, uh, situation. You you have plenty of weapons on this team that can allow them to be where they are, which is undefeated, but at the same time help out an offensive line that really does need it just based on it being depleted. And you segued right back into what I was about to talk about, John, so thank you for that because, yeah, there were, there's been a lot of injuries in the offensive line, especially in this past week. We all know Sebastian Vollmer, who left in the first half with what was described as a head injury, which probably means a concussion. And they entered the game with six healthy offensive linemen. And then Romer left, that was five. And then Michael Williams, who is a tight end, he played some right tackle. And, and Brian Stork, who I, I don't know where they – you know, he, he's just played every – I think every position on the offensive line, which is – and, and in, a, in a matter of week, which is amazing to me. And that was his first action since training camp, which is amazing. But, Josh, talk about the job overall that – Coach Dave DeGuglielmo of the offensive line has done, and I don't, I don't think it gets enough attention. So, talk about that. I mean, there's so many things you could say. Uh, you got, you got a whole bunch of guys, <laughs> rookies, David Andrews, um, Shaq Mason, and 
um, I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody, but I mean, there's so many guys that are rotating in and out, so many guys getting hurt. It's, it's just, I don't, I, I mean, I can't put into words. It's just, it's, uh, there's other teams in the NFL who have had injuries, but I, I think New England does a better job replacing injuries than any other team in the NFL. And Ra- I think that's what's Ra- on Rome. the It's Rome. <laughs> Ah, in the house. What's up, buddy? How you doing? Yeah, pretty good, How you man. doing, buddy? I'm good. Just sitting up here watching my cousin play on on um this Oregon State game right now. Okay, well, thanks for listening, man. All right, no problem, man. It might get a little loud in here, so just throw me on mute. I'm still listening. I'll put you on mute there, sir. <laughs> yeah, it's all good, bro. <laughs> all right, thanks to all for listening. I mean, I was a car. But, uh, that's good. Yeah, that was surprising. <laughs> um, well, I forgot what I was saying. Basically, what I was saying, I think, is that New England does a great job replacing guys. And and I, I really think if somebody else got hurt, New England would find somebody. Now, <laughs> there comes a point where you can't replace people, but we're not at that point quite yet. yet. <laughs> quite yet. <laughs> and, John, I'll throw well, the I think same for a lot of teams, you. it would yeah, be. Yeah. I think that's the difference between them and everybody else is that uh, for a lot of teams in the NFL with the depleted offensive line, the injuries that they've had there, you wouldn't be able to pull off what you did last week with the, the makeshifting of pretty much everybody that ended that game. Uh, most teams in the NFL couldn't do what the Patriots did last Sunday. That's right. And you were searching for a lot of names. Cameron Fleming was one of them. Yeah, he yeah. was on the practice squad a couple of weeks ago playing left tackle. That's a position he's never played before. And, again, so it was playing right tackle and, and Michael Williams. And it's amazing that they scored 27 points because I just think that David Gugano is going to make – that's done an amazing job throughout his two years with the Patriots. And there was a lot of, there was a lot of talk about him, oh, why he's a former Jad and all this, but – I think he deserves very much kudos for that. And hey, more, we, yep. Before we go on, we since we're talking offensive line, we should mention the Patriots signed Josh Klein to a two-year contract extension. So that's good. I that, mean, we're, that's <laughs> very good, good sign. Yeah, well, I, I and, think it just demonstrates that this team is uh, is really that they feel the need to make sure that whatever offensive lineman they still have that they can take care of. And let's face it, it's a system that really does allow uh, for the uh, the mixing and matching that uh, uh, the coaching staff does with this group. Yeah, and I got the contract information right here. It's a two-year contract extension to 2017 worth up to $4.9 million with $750,000 of it guaranteed. And I think it's I think it's good value considering that a guy like Logan Mankins was making eight and a half million dollars for his contract. And he may not be an all-pro like, like a Mankins, but I haven't been seeing too much pressure up the middle against Tom Brady the last couple of years, so I think it's good enough. Here's the one thing that the Patriots have learned from the Logan Mankins deal. They'll never make that kind of a deal again for an <laughs> offensive lineman. Yeah. Absolutely not. <laughs> Especially the way he's looked in uh, Tampa Bay. It's just... Not well, it didn't matter. It, it's the amount of money. It, it, it's what kind of a hit that t- that gave to the salary cap. It really did put the Patriots in kind of a bind until they finally were able to uh, unload Mankins to Tampa Bay. They'll never make that mistake again. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Hey, that, that, that was just a... I want to make a question to both of you, and, and I've thought about this a lot. To, to me, it seems like you can get offensive linemen you know, later in the draft or – so my, I guess my question is going to be, do you think the big contracts for offensive linemen are really kind of a overrated – I don't know how to put it. I guess, Is it a little bit overrated to overpay for offensive linemen, or do you think that there are certain linemen that you just can't pass up on type? I think there's always going to be that stud offensive lineman that you're going to drool over and try and get. Uh, I think that that's going to take place in, in every draft that uh, uh, the NFL conducts. But I think on the on the whole, yeah, I, I think you can find offensive linemen in the in the middle stages of the draft and maybe even toward the end of the draft if uh, if the the position is really deep enough. But there will always be studs that you're going to uh, 
to want to get your hands on and uh, and see if you can find a way to fit him into your budget. I just think that the Patriots, the business model being the way it is, and, and I know that people sometimes criticize the Patriots for the people they hold on to and, for that matter, the people that they let go. But let's face it, their business model is better than anybody else's in the league. Yeah. Uh, New England knows what to let people go. They, they, they don't hold on to – they they don't hold on to people. They're they're not. Uh, I guess you could say they're not loyal sometimes, but that's not how I really look at it. I, they're business oriented is how I look at it. Right, and I think that because of that, the success that they have, uh, one does go with the other. Yep. And also to add to that, I don't. You know, guys like Joe Thomas, who we all remember, who was a you know a very dominant offensive lineman for the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> He's available in the top five picks and you know the Patriots at least for the last 15 years have been picking in the lower half of the of the draft so obviously there's not going to be a lot of offensive linemen that are of that caliber available to you so the fact that the Patriots have gotten what they've gotten for the picks that they've been able to amount I think again it speaks to the coaching staff and it speaks to the front office yeah well, I also think it speaks to the player development and the scouts that go out and really do the uh, uh, the work that's necessary to put these reports together so that when draft day comes, that this team is as prepared as they are uh, based on where they do draft, which, as you both mentioned, is the lower half pretty much on a yearly basis. Right. And speaking of being prepared, the Patriots have been working out several players in the running back position, and I want to point that out for, for folks who may have missed that this week, um, on Thursday afternoon they worked, they invited free agent running backs Pierre Thomas and Robert Turbin. Both were available after Pierre Thomas was cut by the 49ers and Robert Turbin was released by the Cleveland Browns on Tuesday. And Pierre Thomas, of course, well known for his eight seasons with the New Orleans Saints. He has 822 career rushing attempts, 3,757 yards, 28 touchdowns, he also has 327 passes, 2,608 yards with 12 touchdowns, and got a Super Bowl ring. And the 49ers signed to a various cadet earlier in the week. Then that prompted the release of Pierre Thomas. And Robert Turbin has 249 career rushing attempts for 988 yards and 45 passes for 435 yards and two touchdowns. According to Doug Kite of NESN, Turbin was cut by the Seahawks and claimed off of waivers by the Browns on September 10th but Turbin carried the ball just 18 times for 60 yards in three games with the Browns. So I want to ask you guys, do do you think any of these two guys I just mentioned, if the Patriots were to kick the tires with either one of them or, or maybe both of them, do you think that they could help the Patriots in their quest to, quote-unquote, replace Deion Lewis? I think uh, it certainly would just be a death move. If, to me, I just look at it this way. If Pierre Thomas can't make the 49ers roster – I'm not really sure there has to be some kind of <laughs> – there has to be some reason why he's not on the team still. So he's probably not in great shape right now or something along that lines. And I just honestly believe if he can't make the 49ers roster, then he's probably not going to make the Patriots roster. Turbin, I mean, he's he's just another Pierre Thomas type back to me. Um, I'm not re- – New England always – tries out people like they have people coming in and out all the time uh belichick always has mentioned that he loves he he has people come in just to try out sometimes even if they're not interested in people so i'm not sure we should you know look too far into this i I mean i do know that new england probably does need to add another back some sometime though soon i think the problem is the time of year i mean you've reached the middle of november I think that what you're going to find is, is leftovers like, like Thomas, like Turbin, guys who unfortunately can't necessarily hold jobs because they're, they're good enough to make a roster, but they may not be good enough to stick with the roster for a long period of time. And I think the Patriots, as you both mentioned, are just kicking the tires to just see what's, what's out there. But I think the time of year is really going to make it very difficult for them to find somebody that really can fit into their system without them having to make adjustments to it that they probably don't want to make. Yeah, absolutely. And 
I know I'm skipping ahead about the Washington game because <laughs> really, I, I really didn't like that game. I just felt it was not boring per se, but I just thought there was just so much wrong going into the game. I'm not taking anything away from, from the Redskins because they actually played a really, really good game. And uh, But I do want to mention, I do want to start talking about the Patriots defense because I think that's the – I think that's the story of the season besides Tom Brady. I think this defense, and the numbers show it, they are number three currently right now in rushing defense. They number are two. number five. Number, number two. Excuse me. Yeah, wow. Number I correct myself. And they are, correct me if I'm wrong on this one, Josh, number five in scoring defense? Uh, I believe that's correct, yes. Yes. These are the numbers that I wrote down. But, the fact of the matter is they could be the number one deep scoring defense in the league if that last second touchdown does not happen. And it, it seems like the Patriots give up a garbage time touchdown or two or three or four <laughs> every game or so. I don't know. I don't get that. But, uh, Josh, you first. I, I want to know <laughs> this Patriots defense from Patrick Chung to Logan Ryan, who I think has just has really turned it on this, this past four games, Talk about the Patriots' defense and how good it's been, even without Jamie Collins, which we'll get into when we talk about the Giants. Okay. Well, I don't want to be a naysayer or, you know, negative Nancy type, but I do want to mention that New England's usually ahead a lot, so teams aren't running against them as much. So I think that might be a little bit, <laughs> little bit inflated only because of that fact. But with that said, New England has done a good job against the run, and but I'm more impressed by the secondary overall because I think going into the season, that was what everyone was worried about. And to me, it's the bright spot on the team. And, and Logan Ryan, I'll tell you what, that guy, he, I didn't, wasn't even sure he was going to make the team at one point. And, and now he's, he's up to me playing like the best cornerback on the team right now. And that's saying a lot because we have a – you know, another guy who's pretty talented on the other side <laughs> So um, with Malcolm Butler. So uh, it's a good situation to be in to have a guy like Logan Ryan stepping up. And then don't forget Justin Coleman. He's been playing good. I mean, not great, but he's definitely been involved, and you can't knock him for that. So, yeah, I'm impressed with our defense. I do, like I said, I do think the run defense ranking is a little bit <laughs> inflated. Well, even if it is, I mean, this team is only allowing 17.9 points a game. Right. And, again, I think it is about the system and not necessarily the players. And I think the Patriots are demonstrating that this system, if it's, if it's executed properly, can be executed by anybody that's out there. Yeah, and they're gonna have, they have a lot to live up to in to last season's defense in the second half. It's, it's coming on to the time where I remember last season's D, they started their run of not allowing a single touchdown in the fourth quarter for the rest of the year. And that was included well, in the Well, you've got to remember the bodies that were out there. I mean, think of that secondary that was out there last year as opposed yeah. to the one that's playing right now. You, you have some, uh, some serious talent that uh, was manning the corners last year that is not necessarily there now, but – it doesn't seem to make any difference, and I do think that's because the system is being executed the way it was meant to be. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. And we'll talk about one of those players at the end of the show who doesn't necessarily look at least like he's worth that much money that they're paying him, but we'll get to that <laughs> later. <laughs> um, what else did I want to talk about with the Washington game? Oh, one more thing, and then we'll move on to the Giants. Uh the onside kick, I, I, here's the thing about a well-executed, successful onside kick. I mean, even on the best of them, the offense will have the first chance to make the play. So if you're ever going to recover an onside kick, you have to go in knowing that someone on the other side has to screw up if it's going to work. And that's why the odds are less than 10% to recover one. So the decision to go for it, it works a lot of ways. Of course it was successful. Now teams will be put on alert that they'll use it. So now they have to spend time working on that instead of working on other things. So it may improve a possible return because the front line just can't take it off. But I just think it was a very, very good executed play. And that's another reason why the Patriots are – that's why they're above everybody else because they're just always looking to get an, an, an extra oomph on their opponent. So, uh, John, I want to know what you thought about the onside kick. 
I think it's just another demonstration of the Patriots being a, a play, two plays ahead of whoever the opposition is on the other side of the field. And I, I think that the onside kick was a classic example of the Washington Redskins not being p- prepared for the potential unexpected. And the Patriots sensed it, and so they took advantage of it. And I do think that that's what this team does really better than anybody else. They take advantage of your lack of preparation and your lack of understanding of the opposition that you're up against. And to me, that's a classic example of the Patriots just really taking advantage of all the elements that allow them to be who they are and and what they they believe that they are. Josh, what did you think? For me, I mean... uh... I guess I'm a little bit different than both of you because I think that they should have used that against a better team. <laughs> I, I don't know. I felt like they were wasting something on uh, on the Redskins. But, I mean, it worked, and you can't knock that. I mean, anything that works it's on on the Patriots' side, it makes me happy. So, I mean, it, it was a good play, and I do, I do agree that it does show that they're a step ahead of everyone, but I, I kind of wish they saved it for a better game. Well, I think if you're going to if you're going to try something like that, you're going to try it in a situation that you think you you've got under control. And I think yeah. for the most part against the Redskins last week, they had that game pretty much under control. And so it allowed them to try some things that maybe against a better opponent, uh, you you might want to keep it in the bag because you're not necessarily sure when you gain control of that game. But Last week, the Patriots had control of that game pretty much from the get-go, and so it allowed them to be a little bit more flexible with some of the tricks in the bag that they, from time to time, like to bring out. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. All right, I said one last thing about the Washington Redskins game. I have to point out this one last thing because Uh-oh. this I, – I, yeah, I have to bring this up because I'm really – this is concerning to me. The, the Patriots were 1-3 and three starting on first and goal. And, my friends, that's not going to cut it in the playoffs, to be honest with you. And that's the kind of stat that likely, likely loses you a game against a more formidable opponent. The 3-6 and six stat in the red zone, uh, that's probably the worst showing I think I've seen in the year. And now, I know I'm nitpicking, but a lot of it, and of course a lot of it can be excused to the offensive line situation, but for whom much is granted, much is expected, I believe, or some such. But uh, what do you think about, what do you guys think about the, the lack of success in the red zone for this game? Uh, I think a lot was to do with the Redskins <laughs> had a game plan. They came and they executed uh, uh, what they wanted to do, and sometimes that happens. Uh, New England's not going to do everything perfectly. I mean, and, and the one thing I'll say about this game overall for New England, it, it wasn't their best performance to me at all this season, but even when they don't play their best game, they were still way a, a lot better than the Redskins, and that's this says a lot about the team that you know New England is a team. Look, I, I think the red zone could be a problem. I, I think you may be correct about that. That that might be something that they need to work on. But I do think that uh, you know the Redskins showed up, and and I think they played about as well as they could yeah. with uh, the opposition that they were going up against. I, I think that they they posed some problems for the Patriots that uh, took them a little while to figure out. Uh, but I think that uh, overall, uh, the Patriots had that game pretty much set up the way they uh, they figured it to be and, and figured it to go and uh, were able to do enough to win. Uh, was it their best performance of the year? No, probably not. But still, I think that, uh, you know, based on some of the issues that took place in that game, they were still able to uh, – uh, to do things the way that they uh, had scripted it out to be done. And that's more often than not, that's going to be good enough for them to uh, to move on and, and get ready for the next opponent. And in this case, it was. Yep. yep. And, again, <laughs> I'm nitpicking. They're 8-0. So, I mean, that's that's really <laughs> the, tip of, the tip of the iceberg to be doing that. But I just had to point that out so I could, you know, at least be fair to the people who listen to the show and be like, oh, he's not being fair. So, there you go. Well, let's face it. Look, look, let's look at it this way. I think the interesting thing about the NFL season to this point is that you're not just talking about one undefeated team. You're not talking about two undefeated teams, but you're talking about three of them. And I think that's uh, that's rather impressive for the NFL, even at this stage of the year. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and that that is 
truly amazing. I don't think I, there was some stat, I don't know, I can't even recite it off the top of my head, but the fact that three of them are still undefeated, that's amazing. Yeah. And I look, I'm not a big fan of the Cincinnati Bengals. I do think that they'll find a way to mess this up before it's all said and done. <laughs> but I, I, I agree. The, the fact that they're still undefeated at this point does say something about the maturity of Andy Dalton and maybe the maturity of that, uh, that team in general. Josh, you have an opinion on the Bengals? <laughs> uh, I think I think Andy Dalton will be the the guy that loses them a game eventually. I, I honestly believe that he he will make mistakes eventually. Right now they're playing you know they're playing good football, and you can't knock you can't knock that they are winning football games. And another team that is doing really well this year, Carolina, to me is doing just enough. But I don't know. I don't think they're gonna. I don't think – I even still think there's one game New England could lose this year, so I'm not really 100% sold that our team is going to go undefeated either. Well, I think the Patriots yeah, we, schedule was one that that led you to believe that they could have this kind of a year. It, it was not what I call a, a daunting schedule, to say the least. Yeah. And I think that uh, uh, they've taken advantage of uh, of what's been presented to them. And, and I find it rather surprising – you're talking about the defending Super Bowl champions, and you look at that schedule, and it doesn't really suggest that uh, uh, the gauntlet was set up for them after they won last February. And to me, that was kind of surprising. Yeah, but as far as we know, you know the Patriots are always every opponent's Super Bowl, and we all know that from watching Rex Ryan and you know, getting his te- getting his team pumped up. We all know that from. From last year in the Chiefs game, which I don't want, like to bring up because Josh went to that game. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so yeah, you know, the Patriots are, the, are every opponent's Super Bowl. So, but as far as the Bengals are concerned, I'm not from Missouri, but they need to show me. Every, every time they get into the playoffs, they just go out. So they are very impressive. I will, I will give them that. But I just need to see it before I truly believe it. Well, I, and I think that's the thing about the Bengals. I think most people would agree with you that they have not demonstrated that they are a big stage, big game team, and until they do, people will always be hesitant to give them that credit. Absolutely. So that, that's, I guess that's where they play the games. There's a whole half of the season left to go, so we'll definitely see the cream of the crop come to roost or whatever that saying is. <laughs> I'm really messing <laughs> up with my cliches today. I don't know what it is. You're doing but, outstanding. Um, Oh, please. <laughs> but um, let's talk about these New York football giants. Oh, boy. And I, I, I'm not gonna, I don't know if I'm going to really watch this game. I, I, I never say that about a Patriots game. But, <laughs> but I just, I just I'm not, not that I'm scared of the Giants or anything like that, but I just do not want to see another highlight of Super Bowl 42 or Super Bowl 46 again, especially Super Bowl 42, because, I mean, it's – if people, it was eight years ago. Why, why are they still rehashing it? But I understand, yes, the, the, the Giants do have a better record against the Patriots, especially since 2008. And they are totally justified in that. But those games are not going to mean anything come tomorrow afternoon. And I, I, really, I really, really hope that they focus on the game instead of that game. But <laughs> am I am I am I being too delusional in, the, yes, in not wanting to watch that? Yeah, I'm sure that there'll be some moments where that will come up. Yes, yeah, but let's face it, Tom Coughlin has done a great job of game planning against the Patriots in the past, and I do think that that uh, that does deserve some credit. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I'll just mute the TV whenever they show the highlights. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, let's talk about the Giants. They're, they're actually entering a tough part of their schedule. We're talking about strength of schedules. They won on Sunday against the struggling Bucks team, and, of course, they needed to do that. So because the remaining schedule was tough, of course, they play the Patriots. And to remain ahead of the Philadelphia Eagles, they're going to they're gonna have to uh, play games against teams that have kind of a combined 37-19 and 19 record and – of course, they play the Panthers at home, and they have tilts against the Vikings, which are six and two, which is very surprising, and the five and three Jets. And the division may be decided with the regular season finale against the Eagles, which is interesting to me. But um, I want to get started breaking down this game, and you know how we do it, Josh. 
we're going to start with the Patriots. I think that uh, we haven't we haven't had we haven't talked about the Garrett Blount yet. I think the Garrett Blount has been really coming into his own the last four the last few games. They haven't been really great at it, but a lot of it has been by design, especially with plus defenses in the Buffalo and the Jets. But um, most of the snaps he played last week, and I think he really did himself a favor with a big 129 yard game. Again, we talked about we talked about Deion Lewis ad nauseum on this show, and James White, Brandon Bolden, and the like. And the Giants' run defense has been slowly steadying downhill the past month. And Jonathan Hankins, who's their best run stuffer, they lost him. And I think even against a bang up, banged up um, offensive line of New England, I think they'll find some gaps to run through with this Giants um, defense. So. Josh, what do you think about the Patriots running backs? Yeah, I think LeGarrette Mount's going to get his fair share of carries. He's going to definitely be involved. Uh, I think that – I think I mentioned this earlier. I, I'm really more interested – because I know Blunt's going to get the ball. Uh, I want to know how many how many times is James White going to be on the field? How many times is Brandon Bolden going to be on the field? I just looked at the Patriots' updated – depth chart and the most recent one shows James White as the number two which doesn't surprise me at all I, I want to see James White in this game um, he can't replace Deion Lewis so I'm not going to look for I'm not going to look for that I want to so I want to see some um, you know improvement from his last time he got a, got the opportunity that's what I look forward to see and from our running backs in this game is James White performance while he's involved Look, I think when you talk about the Giants, you're talking about a team that a couple of weeks ago against the Saints gave up 505 yards and seven TDs to Drew Brees. I do think the Patriots are going to throw the football all over the yard tomorrow and use that as the way to move this team down the field. I don't think that they're going to to run the football as much because I think they feel that they've got an advantage with their wide receivers against that secondary. Absolutely, and that's the next thing we're going to talk about, John. I think giving giving up an average of 308 yards a game, which is obviously dead last in the league, and the Giants only have nine sacks as a team, and there's there's a meme going out there that Taylor Jones has more sacks than the Giants, all the Giants combined, which is very interesting. Yeah, yeah, the Giants' defense is terrible, horrible, no good, very bad, whatever you want to call it, and – they did get back Jason Pierre-Paul, though, and he's made his presence felt. But with Prince of Mukamura still injured, I think there's some huge holes in the secondary to be had for Tom Brady, like John said. And J. Ron Hosley, who is a backup cornerback, Brady, is, I think, is going to pick on him like a scab. And he's uh, Mukamura's fill-in. He's a fourth-year corner, and he's just struggled so badly. I've watched a lot of Giants games, especially being here in New York. And there's just too many options in the passing game for New England to emphasize the passing game. So they'll probably single him up. So I don't think we really need to delve too much into the passing offense, do we? Because <laughs> look, I, I you know you mentioned Jason Pierre-Paul. Let's face it, the guy played 73% of the defensive snaps last week. Here's a guy that hasn't played all year and had to play that much of the game last week against Tampa Bay. And I do think although he was effective in putting pressure on Jameis Winston, I just think it shows the the problem that the Giants have, which is getting to the quarterback, which is putting pressure on the quarterback. You're going up against what we've pretty much have assumed is somewhat of a, de- a depleted offensive line. If the Giants can't take advantage of an offensive line that's got guys in different spots and, and in spots that they're not supposed to be in, then I think uh, this could be a very long afternoon for that Giant defense. Josh, how about you? <laughs> Brady could have 400 yards pass in this game. I mean, literally, uh, they're going to pass a lot, and it, it might be one of those games where we might see maybe 13 ball carriers in the whole game. That's, I mean, look what Drew Brees did to that offense. My God. Uh, <laughs> New England will be passing a lot, and it might become ugly because of that. So I'm looking forward to it. I agree. I, I do think that that is the approach they will take. They'll yeah. throw the football. They'll – They'll go with the wide receiver screens. They'll go with the intermediate stuff. They will 
they'll just throw the football because they realize that the the advantage they have is something that you just can't ignore. Yeah. Yeah, it's blaring right in front of your eyes. And <laughs> but knowing knowing Bill Belichick, he'll probably do something that all three of us are sort of saying differently. Make us, so make us look stupid. Yeah, make <laughs> us look silly. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm not sure that he'll do anything too crazy because I I think that he's. If he's looked at that tape, and I know he has, I'm sure he's going to, to realize that uh, he doesn't necessarily have to do anything crazy to uh, to be able to move that ball down the field. I, I think the blueprint that the Saints came up with uh, for that game a couple of weeks ago, even though it was a, a, a crazy game and one that you don't expect to take place on a weekly basis still, I think the blueprint the Saints put out there is uh, is one that really can't be ignored, and that is that the Giants' secondary just isn't good enough and that they're not getting enough pressure on the quarterback, which really does expose that secondary to uh, some pretty good wide receivers and a pretty good tight end, let's face it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, Bronk is probably going to go out on them too, I'm pretty sure. So let's switch the ball over to the Giants, and let's start talking about the running backs. They have a running back by committee, and, of course, they have Rashad Jennings, who I like, and Andre Williams, they have, Orleans Darqua, and former Patriot Shane Vereen. And the Giants haven't been really effective running the ball this season. They average only 96.7 yards a game. And Josh and I have talked about this a lot on this show. I don't think they use Shane Vereen as much as they should be. They really don't. And the Patriots front seven has really turned it up a notch with the run defense the past month. They, uh, They only allow 89 yards a game. Alan Branch is playing his best football since he came to New England, and Malcolm Brown, Dominic Easley, who's actually been very explosive. I've been watching him very intently over the last couple of weeks, and he's been very explosive. And Silver Salinga also, they have a nice rotation going inside. And I think they'll be able to bottle up the Giants running game. What do you guys think? Look, I think this is Tom Coughlin. Um, I think it's his M.O. I think he's going to try and run that football. I think that he wants to keep that Patriot offense off the field, and I think he's probably convinced that the best way to do it is to be able to run this ball, try and uh, create uh, short yardage situations for himself on second and third downs, and I most importantly shorten the game. And I think that Coughlin is convinced that that's the best way to do it, even though you know Eli Manning's having a very good year running, uh, throwing the football, no question about it, but... I think that Coughlin is convinced that uh, keeping the ball on the ground, grinding this game out, and uh, shortening the game as best he can is is the best way to go. Uh, I completely agree with you. I Honestly, that's how I looked at this game from the get-go. I thought, I, I really think the Giants' best chance to win is obviously not to let Tom Brady and the Patriots have the ball. Plain and simple, if they can establish a run game on, on us, um, th- they're going to be in this game. That Really, that's what they need to do. If they can't establish a, a run game, then, uh, well, Eli Mann's probably going to have his mistakes is what I would expect. <laughs> yeah, the last thing the Giants want is a one-dimensional approach here, and, and they really can't afford to be that way. So I, I think that uh, they'll do everything they can to establish a run and – throw when it's least expected, but I, I do think that they're running the football really is their best chance to uh, to make this game ugly, and I think that's how the Giants, if they're going to win this game, that's how it's done. It's going to be an ugly win. Yeah. Yeah, and let's talk about Eli Manning and the passing offense, because I think this is probably the stiffest test that the Patriots secondary is going to see this season. And you know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about ODB, Odell Beckham Jr., and his Fetty Wap dances and all that stuff. <laughs> um, I think it's going to be a really tough test for, for the Patriots. And Ruben Randall, who's still bothered by a sore hamstring, he's limited his ability to go deep. So they're going to have the Patriots are going to have to bring pressure on Eli Manning on Sunday. And Chandler Jones, obviously, is going to be a key factor in that. Rob Nikovich and... I think that they're going to have to really be stiff up front and be able to tackle him and get him on the ground, which is something that it seems like Patriots defenders cannot do, get Eli Manning on the ground, which is amazing. And that's partially because the Giants have had a lot of good offensive line 
over the years. But, again, going back to that Super Bowl, I just think of that play where it's just Eli. Oh, gosh. But I'm not, I'm not going to try to relive it for those Patriots fans who have PTSD or anything like that. <laughs> so um, I, just, I just think that Logan Ryan, Malcolm Butler, and J- Justin Coleman, they're really going to have their hands full. And Devin McCourty, safety at the top, he's probably going to have over-the-top help with Beckham and Deron Harmon as well. Patrick Chung will probably play close to the box and help underneath. And Eli Manning is probably going to have to use Shane Vereen and Dwayne Harris underneath out of the backfield. And no one knows the Patriots defense better than Shane Vereen. And he's always been a handful for those linebackers. So it's, it's, very, it's a very tough task. That's, that's short answer. It's a very tough task for the Patriots, I believe. John, what do you think? Well, I think that what they'll do is – they may leave Malcolm Butler out there on an island all by himself with Odell Beckham uh, under the assumption that Beckham's going to make his plays. I don't think you're going to completely shut him out. The idea is that he doesn't make too many of them. Uh, and so if you give Beckham his plays and you take away everybody else, you're still going to be able to have a successful afternoon defensively. And let's face it, you know, Eli Manning's having a great year. He's on pace for 4,158 yards and a career-high 34 touchdowns. He's been doing very well throwing the football down the field and and really elevating this passing game to a level that it hasn't been at in the past couple of years. Let's face it, this is a Giants team that hasn't been to the playoffs in the last three years. So things have been elevated, and Eli's done a great job. I do think that, uh, you know, as I say, Malcolm Butler is going to have Odell Beckham all afternoon, and how many plays Butler can make against Beckham uh, will at least determine – how close this game is as it goes along. Maybe it doesn't determine who wins or loses, but maybe it does determine the margin of victory one way or the other. Yeah, I think we saw in the first game of the year when uh, Malcolm Butler was put against Antonio Brown, which, by the way, I would say is the best receiver New England plays all year, but yeah, the, the, he, he fared well. I mean, it wasn't great because uh, Antonio Brown had a day on him still. But I, I agree with John. I think New England's going to accept that he's, he, he's not going to stop Odell Beckham every play, but he's going to do enough to make it difficult for him, if that makes any sense. And, and, I think, and I think Malcolm Butler can do that. He's done that all year against the best receiver on, on every team he's played this year, not to the elite standard of Beckham Jr. or Antonio Brown, but you know some talented wide receivers nonetheless. I think the best way to put it would be if the front seven of the Patriots does their job and puts pressure on Manning as that game wears along, whatever plays that Beckham makes against Butler shouldn't stop the Patriots from winning. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, Josh, he, Antonio Brown definitely had a day on Malcolm Butler, but I don't think he had a 264 kind of yard oh, type no, of no, day, no, no, if, no. You know, yeah. if, you, yeah. if you know what I mean. Yeah. No. Well, let's face it. If Beckham goes off like that, then this is going to be a tough afternoon for the Patriots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But uh, I, I really said that just to get get inside of uh, Jerome's head if he's still listening. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, quickly, let's talk about the uh, special teams. I always like to talk about special teams because that's what the Patriots focus on as well, not just offense and defense. And we talk about Stephen Kostowski a lot and Ryan Allen. But the Giants kicker, Josh Brown, has made 23 straight field goals heading back to last year. And Brad Wing, the punter, is averaging 45 and a half yards a punt. And the Giants coverage units have been solid as well. And I talked about Dwayne Harris earlier, 33 yards of kickoff, including a 100-yarder against Dallas. So, and the Giants have also bought the punt this year. So I think this is one of the few times where I think that it's, you, could, you could say it's a push in terms of special teams. Well, if this game comes down to a a field goal, then I think that uh, the Giants have certainly done their job because I'm sure that's what Tom Coughlin's hoping for, to keep this game close and get it into the fourth quarter where he's within a a one-score game of uh, either tying it or or potentially winning it. So uh, I think if you're the Patriots, you want to put the Giants out of their misery as quickly as you possibly can. Yeah. uh... Josh? The uh, special team, I think we have the best kicker, <laughs> and we have the best uh, coverage guy in Matthew Slater. But, I mean, to me, uh, kickoffs are really 
not that big of a deal because uh, Gronkowski is going to kick the ball to the back of the end zone like he does the majority of the time. Um, punts is where I – punt coverage by New England is what I'm most interested in. It hasn't been an issue so far this year. I don't expect it to be again. And I'd like to see Amendola or Edelman, who's, whoever has returned punts this weekend for us. Um, maybe one, one of those guys can break one loose. That would be good to, good to see. I will say this about the kickoffs, though. You're getting to the time of year where, you know, drilling the ball out of the end zone isn't as easy as it is in, say, September and October. Sure. In November and December, it does get to be a little different. And so uh, you may see some kickoff returns from teams as, uh, as this month goes along and especially as next month goes along because, uh, let's face it, the weather has changed. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, come on, guys. It's time. It's time. Put on your belts and hey, <laughs> and be a beacon caps. Before we do this, <laughs> right. let's let's get Jerome on here to have his prediction for this game if he's still here. If he's not, then we'll just move on. Okay, Jerome. Jerome? Oh, hey, Jerome. how's it going there, Josh and DJ? How y'all feeling, man? Good. We want to know your prediction for the Patriots and Giants game. Well, if history has taught us anything, is that the New England Patriots they seem to have complete issues with the New York Giants for whatever reason. And hopefully, as a Raider fan or a Patriot hater, the same thing happens tomorrow. Do I think it will? Probably not. I think this Patriot team is probably just too strong and have too much offense. The Giants, they'll be a spirited um, out, but the Patriots, they'll find a way to pull it out late. I'll say Patriots 35, Giants 30. Well, that's very interesting, Jerome. I thought you were going to go the hater route, so I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I very nearly did, DJ, but i got to use my head here. The Giants don't have the defense that they had in 2007 or 2011. Brady's going to pretty much have his way when, whenever he wants. All right, uh, Josh, you go ahead with your prediction. Uh, yeah, I think New England's going to move the ball pretty easily. I, I don't think – I think it's going to be a high-scoring game, but I think New England's going to win by – by 10 or so. So I'll say something like 35-25 or something along that line. John? I think 34-17 Patriots. I, I think you'll see Brady throw the ball maybe 40-45 times. I think he'll be successful doing it. Uh, and I think that uh, the guy that blinks is going to end up being Eli Manning because, unfortunately, for that giant offense, they're going to have to match everything that the Patriots' offense can do during this game, and I'm not sure that that giant offense is built to be able to play that kind of a game. And, John, I'm, go- I'm with you as far as the score prediction. I definitely have them up above 35. I think they're going to win 38-17. to 17. I really do. And it's not just because that – it's not just because of the way the Patriots' offense is performing, even without – their offensive line being a total fence. And I just think that the Giants' defense is not – and I watched that entire Saints game against the Giants. It was, it was a pinball machine. It was unbelievably not a defensive-minded game. So the, Drew Brees went all over the field. I think Tom Brady is going to do the same thing. I think it's going to be – I'll just say this. If you have Tom Brady on your fantasy team, expect at least 30 points. Well, I'll say this. I mean, if we're correct and Tom Coughlin's going to try and grind this game out, then you wouldn't expect that there's going to be a lot of scoring in this game. And I think that's the approach that Coughlin really wants to take here. He doesn't want this game to get into the high 20s, low 30s, because that puts the Giants at a bit of a disadvantage. So if they can grind this game out, then I think you're going to find a low-scoring game, which suits the Giants to a T. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that's his that's his um emotes of this game being any type of close. I think that they're gonna have to run the ball and they're gonna have to run it often to get even a sizable type of advantage. So I mean look, let's face it, go- if Eli Man has gotta throw the ball forty times, they're in trouble. Yeah. Definitely. So before we go, guys, and Dom, we usually do this on the show. We usually laugh at at the other AFC East or other Patriot rivals that are doing not so good. And I think we should talk about the most recent NFL football game that we all watched against the Bills, with the Bills and the Jets. I just think that game was just unbelievable. Well, 
I mean, look, let, let's yeah. face it. I think that uh, if you're a Buffalo Bill fan, you have to be rather disappointed uh, at, at some aspects of that game. But the Giants, my God, Todd Bowles was just taking chances in that fourth quarter that was so unnecessary. And the two field goals that he decided not to go for and instead went on fourth down tries was just very difficult to understand. And I'm sure he got ripped in the New York media for doing it because uh, it really did, I think, take away any chance that the Jets had of pulling that game out. (laughs) I don't know. This might be weird, but my main thing from this game was those stupid uniforms. I mean, <laughs> what the <laughs> heck was that nonsense? Oh, my God. <laughs> but anyway, it, it, was so, like, it, was, it was like Chris Kringle took a clap on MetLife Stadium. Yeah, it was bad. I, I'm glad I wasn't colorblind. But uh, um, as far as the game, I mean, it was a, it was a poor, uh, poor performance by both teams. I mean, the Bills did pull it out. Good for them. Um, but... <laughs> It was a, it was a, it, it was a sloppy game if you ask me and how Rex Ryan acted about winning that game was kind of foolish too if you ask me but that's well I'm not surprised at Rex's reaction after it was over I mean let's face it you know he was fired by the Jets so I'm not yeah. surprised at his reaction but I I just think that the game management by the Jets and by that coaching staff is really hard to understand and was probably even harder to explain when it was over. Yeah, my whole thing on, on that is audacity means nothing with stupidity. I mean, you know, one thing is to be bold, the other is to be stupid. And Todd Bowles, that was just stupid. It was a stupid decision. And independent of the conversion, because it's more or less like a lottery, you know. Sometimes they get the conversion, and then the morons in the press start the ball washing, like giving merits or something when they get lucky, and they don't take the best decision at the time. It, the game is still won by a difference on points. The team with the most points wins. You don't get them all at once. So three points here, and it's a good chance. I think I really think they should have took, should, they should have taken the field goal. And yeah, John, it was it was a, it was a riot listening to New York sports radio after that game, and they were pretty much saying what we all have been saying. So <laughs> it was just a pleasure to listen to. I'm curious as to what Bowles' explanation was for leaving the six points on the field. It, it doesn't. It didn't make sense. But I, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> didn't make sense. I don't know. I see most of these new coaches. They just like to go for it on four downs. I, I see that in Chuck Pagano as well. He just creates that impression, like, oh, he's got balls. Oh, he's gonna go for it. How brave, you know? Well, I, I mean, I think that there there are times to go for it, and there are times not to. I just think that the the time of game that Bowles picked to go for it, especially the first time. Was, was just way too early. Take the field goal, keep yourself within a one-score game, and allow the game to play itself out. He just never allowed that fourth quarter to play itself out, and I think that was his major mistake. Absolutely. And uh, one more tidbit about that game. I posted on our new Facebook page, by the way. You can visit us at facebook.com slash flying up with faithful. We got about 70 people who like who liked the page already, so thank you all so much for liking the page, we're posting Patriot stuff all the, all the time there. And I posted a video from uh, Sirius XM of Darrell Revis or Darrell Mevis <laughs> getting burnt by uh, Sammy Watkins. And not that I'm saying that he's not a good player, yet he's absolutely one of the best quarterbacks in the league still. But giving him that much money, I don't think it's justified, especially when you have the hamstring injury and you have all those things going on. So I, I, I just – that Rick right there, and if you go to the Facebook page, it's there. Just look at him just get totally burnt. And he's, he, that's happened a lot over the last over the last four games. Pierre Garçon did it to him. T.Y. Hilton did it to him. So I just think that, oh, well, <laughs> Darrell, enjoy your money. Well, look, I mean, Sammy Watkins is, is one of the elite wide receivers. I got a chance to see him in college when he was at Clemson. I mean, we're talking about uh, uh, a gifted wide receiver that uh, can make anybody look bad. And, and let's face it, Darrell Revis, with some of these guys that he's going up against uh, on an individual basis, is giving up some age and probably some first-step quickness that uh, is starting to, uh, to show up. And I thought Thursday night from time to time, uh, Sammy Watkins had that first step that Darrell Revis just maybe doesn't necessarily have anymore. Yeah, absolutely. 
I mean, for that type of money, you have to be tightly close to blanket coverage island. I mean, I, I, from what I've seen, it hasn't been that way. But anyway, <laughs> enough about, again, enough about teams who don't matter. Let's talk about the Patriots. So uh, that's about it for us. We covered a lot today. Wow, that was amazing. So uh, let me see. Let's do some housekeeping first. I get, again, visit our Facebook page. It's it's actually doing pretty well. Seventy people already like it, and it's already been up for I think about a week. Josh made the page, and we already have people flocking to it. So thank you guys so much for liking it. And we'll post this show as soon as it's up, right on the Facebook page, so you can get to it. You can visit me at Atomic Dog Twenty Two. That's me, Atomic Dog Twenty Two. John, he was talking uh, to me on that. Is so can, in my case, is the way you can find yep. me. That's where we, we were talking just a little bit about the game. You can talk about – and Josh is at joshing underscore me. You can visit him there. And let me see what else we have. Yeah, that's about it. Oh, John, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. It's such short notice. Guys, it was a pleasure to do this with you. Hopefully we can do it again. Yeah, it was great having you on uh, on the show. And um, I also like your Boston College write-ups that you do for – and yes, you know, it, it, well, thank you. Well, unfortunately, uh, it, it's been a tough year for them, uh, yeah. although, uh, uh, you know, the youth of that football team has gotten a chance to, uh, to um, you know, be, uh, be seen by the public. But uh, it, it's been an unfortunate year. But uh, this week, getting ready for Notre Dame and going to Fenway Park, I think that's going to be a, quite an atmosphere to be a part of. Yeah, it should be. Uh, Boston College should be upset-minded. <laughs> Well, they they better be because this is going to be their bowl game. That's for sure. Yep. <laughs> oh, and John, before you go, b- plug your uh, other two shows that you do on here on NGSC. Well, we do a, a baseball show on Friday night. It's called In the Batter's Box, and uh, we uh, right now are doing a lot of the off-season stuff, the major awards, and uh, a lot of the trades that took place at the uh, uh, the general managers' meetings last week. And uh, uh, I do a, a Boston College bit for the. Uh, uh, the NGSC uh, Central show on uh, Wednesday night, the, the podcast show with uh, with John Simmer and with uh, Montel Hardy. We uh, uh, we go over the college ranks and the ACC and, and Boston College in particular. Yeah, so a lot of content from John. So make sure you tune into NGSCSports.com as well and check out all the shows here on NGSC with the coach and every other show that you can get right here. And of course, I wouldn't be I'd be remiss if I didn't mention. Jerome's show and Josh's show, NGSC West Recess, Wednesday nights at 11 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Pacific. They cover everything involving the West Coast and sports in general. So that's a must listen every Wednesday night. I recommend you do listen to that. And Josh and Jerome's show involving the Raiders, that's the Black Hole Brigade with Jim Paskowitz. You can listen to that Friday nights at eight at 9:30 right here on NGSC. So, again, a lot of content going on on the site, so it's very exciting. Make sure you visit us at NGSC Sports for all your sports news. So, John, thanks once again. I appreciate it. Guys, it was a pleasure as always. Thank you. Take care. You too. All right. And all right. And for John, for Josh, I'm Shaq. Love, peace, and go Pats. Later. <laughs>